Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. I want to talk from this subject today. Getting out of the fence. Getting out of the fence. Over the past several weeks, we've been engaged in a sermon series called Altered. Everybody say altered. Say it like you expect God to change some things in your life. Say altered. Say it like you believe things are already changing in your life. Say altered. Say it like the enemy is upset that things are about to be altered and he gets agitated every time you say it, but he can't do anything about it. Somebody say altered. Alter. And the primary premise of this series is this, that it is possible to have the right religion, but not work the religion right. That you can have the right religion and not work the religion right. And it's only when you work it right that you get the fullness of the benefits that are available to you through that religion. And so what we've argued is this, an alterless Christianity is a Christianity that does not alter your life. Some things don't get altered with an E until other things get altered with an A. And over the past few weeks, we've, we've talked about what that means. We learned in the first lesson that it means that if some things are going to be altered with an E, it means that I got to identify what needs to die. That some things don't change until other things stop. So instead of focusing on what I need to change, I need to focus on what I need to kill. Because I can't do more prayer until I start doing less of something else. We also identify that some things aren't altered until some things are burned by fire. It means that some issues are heart issues. Some issues are head issues. I can fix that by knowledge. But some issues are heart issues. And I can't fix that until the one who holds my heart puts his hand on my heart and does, my heart with, does with my heart what the potter did with the clay in his hands, forms and shapes my heart into what it needs to be. That only comes from the presence of God. We learned last week also that some things aren't altered until we make sacrifices. Sometimes you got to give up what you value to gain what you value more. Come on and talk to me. And is there anyone in this room can honestly, that can honestly audit and assess your life and say, the more I've grown, the more my values have changed? That there were things that held one place of prestige in my life in one season that I no longer value the way I used to value. And you can tell when it's time to engage in some degree of separation in old relationships is when you see inequity in your values. But today I want to introduce to you another aspect of an altered life, and that is the altar is not just a place where things are put to death. The altar is not just a place where things are consumed with fire. The altar is not just a place where we make sacrifices. The altar is the place where offenses are settled. Anybody in here ever been offended? Okay. Anybody? Because they haven't been offended over there. Anybody over here, have you ever been offended? I love Jesus, but I'm offended. I'm not sensitive, but I can be offended. I don't wear my heart on my sleeve, but I can be offended. It is impossible to live life without dealing with offense. Some people, am I making sense there? Okay, so I don't have to park there. It is impossible to live life without offense. Listen to me. So then it means if I'm going to at one point or another be offended, I must learn the skill of releasing offense so that my offense doesn't become a fence that keeps good stuff from getting in and keeps me from getting out. Ooh, did you hear what I said? I said when we don't manage offense biblically and properly, offense can become a fence that keeps stuff that needs to get to us from getting in and that keeps us from getting out of stuff we need to get out of. This is the danger of offense. Offense can give you the illusion that you're free. Did you, did you understand? You're following me here. See, a fence can give you the illusion that you're free because you can be behind a fence and still move. 
But just because you're moving doesn't mean you're free. Are y'all ready for this? Just because you're moving doesn't mean you're progressing. Just because you're walking doesn't mean you're walking forward. Is there anybody here that can look back over your life and reflect on seasons where you were moving but you weren't going anywhere? You were walking but you weren't walking into your destiny? You were exerting energy and effort but not seeing a return on that investment? Because it's possible not to be shackled but still be bound. Who am I preaching to in here? Offense can become a fence that keeps stuff that needs to get to us from getting to us. And I think this is the essence of what Jesus is saying in this Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. It's the Sermon of the Mount. This is a part and a portion of what's called the Beatitudes. And he starts dealing with them in the latter part of the chapter about the difference between activity external externally and the posture and the position of their heart internally. He's saying just because you're not doing the motion doesn't mean you don't have the motive. Right. So he says, OK, he says, he says, so so he says this, he says, so I want you to understand that you may have the right religion, but I want to make sure you're working the religion right so that you can get the full benefit of the religion, because you can have the right religion, not work it right, not get the right results and think the right religion is the wrong one. When there's nothing wrong with the religion, it's just something wrong with the way you work in it. Prayer works, but you got to work it right. Let me preach in here. I say prayer works but you got to work it right. I say prayer works, but you got to work it right. A man prayed and the sun stood still and the moon held its place. A man prayed and it didn't rain. The man, same man prayed and the heavens opened up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We can do the right thing, but if we don't do it right, it won't work. And when it's not working, you can call the right thing the wrong thing. When it's the right thing, you're just doing it the wrong way. Listen to what Jesus says. He says to his audience in Matthew 5, he says, listen, I know you bring gifts to the altar to offer as sacrifices. You bring goats, you bring calves, you bring whatever. And you bring them because you want to make sure you remove the offense and you reconcile the relationship between you and God. So you bring God a peace offering and you bring God a sin offering because you want you and God to be on the same page. You want the relationship to be good, good, right? He says, but this is the problem. He says, if you come in an effort to make sure offense is removed from the relationship with you and God, yet you remember that there's offense in a relationship with you and someone else. Listen to what he says to them. He says, leave, I'm not gonna bother this. Yes, I am. He, he, says, he says, leave the gift in front of the altar. Don't take it with you because you might be so remorseful that you confuse sorrow with spirituality and you give a gift that belongs on the altar to somebody else. <sighs> I'm not going to bother that. So he says, leave it at the altar so you don't give the wrong thing to the wrong person. He says, Go reconcile it, then come back and present the gift to the altar. Because this, in other words, this is what he's saying. He's saying, I don't want you shouting and it not working. I don't want you praying and it not working. I don't want you praising and it not working. I don't want you giving and you not seeing the full blessing that's attached to your generosity. So he says, whereas other people would just keep taking your calf. I love you enough to say, stop. Because there's something you want to receive at this altar that your heart doesn't have room for because it's full of offense. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. There are things that God wants to do, but you got to make room. If you want him to fill the ark, you got to build one. I don't have time to bother this. Yeah, because the oil will stop running when you stop finding jars. Did you hear what I just said? And there are things we want God to do in our heart. We got to make sure we make room for because God does not compete. He doesn't share. Our heart is a chair. That's a throne, not a couch. 
A couch has room for multiple people. A chair has room for one. And God says, when I come to your heart, if somebody else is sitting in my seat, I don't sit down until they move. I don't share glory. I don't share first place. Because when you know who you are, you don't have to compete. And when you know who you are, you don't have to settle. Let me pause and see if I can find somebody to preach to right there. I said, when you know who you are, you don't have to compete. And when you know who you are, you don't have to settle. When you know who you are, you okay if they don't know who you are. When you know who you are, you don't try to prove to them who you are. Because if you don't have enough sense to see who I am, going out there and experiment a little bit, you'll be back. I want you to find somebody that looks like they need encouragement and high five and tell them they'll be back. They'll be back. They'll be back. You don't miss your water till your well run dry. They'll be back. They'll be back. They think the grass is greener on the other side. They'll be back. They will be back. You don't have to compete. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with your presentation. There's something wrong with their perception. Jesus was God walking in the flesh and people could not perceive him properly. But he had enough sense to let people who had blind problems deal with the ramifications and the repercussions of their blindness. They will be back. God says, I'm not, I'm not fighting with you. I'm the best thing. Hiya, that ever happened to you you will not find anybody more faithful than me I'm going to be there when you up I'll be there when you down I'll be there when you're at your best I'll be there when you're at your worst you can go to the highest heights I'm there if you make your bed in hell I'll get down there with you and we'll dig our way out you will not find anyone better than me he says I'm not going to play with you you need to see who I am I searched all over couldn't find nobody searched high and low still couldn't find nobody nobody greater Okay. <laughs> nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Jesus, Jesus said, I, I don't share, so there's, there are things you want me to do in your heart that you don't have room for because a fence is sitting here. Come here, Brian. Would you be a fence for me? Sit down on the fence. We're praying for more peace, but peace has got to sit on top of a fence. We're praying for more joy, but joy's got to sit on top of a fence. Praying for more hope, hope's got to sit on top of a fence. Because some stuff can't sit down until a fence gets up. Because when a fence comes into your heart, the only seat it can occupy is the one that's reserved for God. There is no couch on your heart. There's a throne. Am I making sense? So Jesus said, okay, you can come to the altar, you can engage in worship, you can engage in prayer, you can engage in the spiritual disciplines, and there's an exchange that could take place that can't take place because when I'm ready to make the exchange, I have nowhere to send it. Because a fence is taking up room. I don't share a seat. I'm too good to you to share a seat. If anybody has to share a seat, I shouldn't have to share a seat. So when a fence, thank you, Brian, when a fence gets up, what you're praying for, sit down. Watch this. So could it be that one of the way the enemy blocks my blessings is by burdening my heart with offense? 
So could it be then that offense is never about the offense? Could it be that the offense is a blessing blocker? Because God, because the enemy doesn't want the seat to be empty when God gets ready to pour something out. Lord, if I had time, I would just... <laughs> this is why you have to receive every word, whether it's a right now word from the scriptures, whether or not it's something you feel intuitively, whether or not it's something that the Holy Spirit is inaudibly communicating to you, you have to receive a word from the Lord as prophetic. You have to receive every word as prophetic, meaning God is talking to me about this now because there's something that's going to happen in my future that is predicated on me getting this right now, meaning that he may not be, may not be about to pour something out in my life today, but if I remove what's on the throne today when he gets ready to pour it out tomorrow then I won't y'all hear me I won't squander like the prodigal son and waste a blessing and have to go through a whole nother season for the father to give me a reserve supply am I making sense so when the Lord says do it, it's because in this next season of your life, it's going to need to be done. If he says let it go, it's because in this next season of your life, your hands are need to be empty. If he says forgive, it's because there's something that's getting ready to come to your life that's going to require you forgiving it now. And I don't know who this is for in this place or watching online today, but whatever he's telling you to do, do it now. Because there's something in your future that is predicated on you obeying now. Are you feeling me? Offense can become a fence that keeps the very thing that you need to get you out of offense from getting in. Listen to me. Because the word doesn't even work where you offended. You ready for me to prove it to you? Go through something that grieves your heart greatly and then let a Christian come with some Christian colloquialism <laughs> and see your response. I don't want to hear that. Let me get, okay, I feel realness right here. I'm going to stay right here. Yeah, I feel realness right here. Right? I mean, people can try to quote scripture to you when you're offended. You know you need to love your enemies. Don't be talking to me about loving my enemies. You think I can't read my Bible. I know more Bible than you. You, need, you just changed the whole discussion. The word, when a seed is sown on a stony heart, it cannot take root. But the very thing that can't get in is the thing that needs to get in to get you out. Don't you mess with me. I said, don't you mess with me. I said, don't you mess with me. There is a liberating aspect to the word of God. The word of God is not just an educator, it's a liberator. Why? Because it's truth and truth sets you free. Wherever you are, that word will come and find you and get you out. That word will handcuff you to it and it will pull you out. Is there anybody here that knows that word knows how to find you? That word, I said, the word knows how to find you. Okay, let me wrap this up, y'all. Y'all not going with me this morning. Listen, uh, offense can become a fence that keeps what needs to get in from getting in. Offense can become a fence that keeps what needs to get in from getting in. And that thing needs to get in to get you out. So offense is never about offense. It's always about your heart. It's always about making the heart hard in an area it needs to be soft in in a future season. So whatever happened to you in one season was never about that season. It was to condition your heart so that your heart wouldn't be in, po in the posture and in the position to take advantage of this one. And the severe, listen to me, I, I believe I can proof text this scripturally, the severity of the attack is sometimes an indication of the nervousness of the enemy. Satanic severity is a revelation of the devil's anxiety. <laughs> <Y 'all, laughs> you, you didn't hear it. I said, if he is attacking you severely, it is a revelation that he has extreme anxiety 
about what is about to happen through your life. And so he is throwing everything he has because he is afraid that if you step into the fullness of your potential, great damage and harm will come to him and his kingdom. He literally killed Jesus. Nervous anxiety. He tried everything he could because satanic severity is a revelation of his extreme anxiety. A fence can become a fence. And so whatever happened then and just about then, it's about your future. Teaching and truth is one of God's discipleship tools. Trauma is one of the devil's. And they both have the same intention to shape you. Did you hear what I said? They both have the same intention to shape you. This is why when God gets a hold of you, there's got to be some breaking. Because you've been shaped. Come here. <laughs> you've been shaped by some things other than teaching. So he's got to break so he can reshape. Because you don't fix hardness without brokenness. Because offense can become a fence that stops what needs to get in from getting in to get you out. It stops people from getting in that need to get in to get you out. And the people you should would let in, you don't let in because you let somebody in before and when you let them in, they didn't manage it right. So this is what you did. You made a vow in your pain. You made a vow in your pain. And it's dangerous to make vows in pain because you're making vows when you're not sober. Pain intoxicates you. Pain ushers you into a state of drunkenness. You become inebriated with pain. You don't make decisions you would normally make when you're in pain. You don't talk to people you'd normally talk to when you're in pain. Or you talk to people you would normally talk to if you weren't in pain. When you're in pain, you see anybody who will listen is safe. Woo! Did you hear what I said? When you're in pain, you'll see anybody who will listen as safe. Somebody asked you, how's the weather outside? Cold, just like the hearts of these men these days. Just no good, just savage. I just hate all of them. I just hate all of them. Just no, I just need to know, do I need a coat? I don't, I don't. But when you're in, come on. Because pain is truth juice. So offense can become offense that keeps what needs to get in from getting in, keeps people that need to get in from getting in. So one of the things that I gotta, I gotta deal with, to deal with offense, y'all need healing hearts and all of that, but one of the things that I gotta do is the first thing I gotta do is I gotta identify the fence. Because if I don't identify the fence, the ministry that needs to come to me can't get to me. So the first step in just trying to step into healing is to remove the obstacle to your healing. I feel this thing right here. It's the fence. It's the fence. So the place you've been burned caused you to make a vow, either, watch this, intentionally or unintentionally, so you developed a lifestyle pattern. So there's a life norm that you've developed of secrecy because the last time you weren't secretive, it burned you. So now you made a vow and you're super secretive and then God sends somebody to your life that you need to be honest with to get free, but you can't because you develop a norm of secrecy that came from a season where you were burned by the enemy. Am I making sense? So before you get healed, the fence of secrecy has to be removed so that the person you can trust can get in so they can help you get out. Give somebody a high five and say, get out. I wish I had some tea and a spoon in here. I said, find somebody and tell them, get out.
So I got to identify the fence. And there are three fences I want you to think through and pray through as we leave today. Number one is the, is the fence of ego. Because sometimes people get offended and the only thing that's really been hurt is your pride. Y'all ready for this one? Yeah, this is an example of when this is the case can be seen when you become upset by how quickly somebody else moved on that you no longer want. Okay. Yeah. I'm in the right service now. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't ride any service but this service right here. Yeah. Um, did you hear what I said? Yeah. If we're honest, some of us have been here before where you don't even want them. But then you see them on the gram all booed up with somebody. Then they just extra on Facebook. So you, they just had to put seven pictures, right? Seven pictures. Just all booed up. Seven pictures. And you and your feelings, and you don't even want them. If they text you right now, you don't want them. But you can be in your feelings. Because you're like, how, how you move on from me that fast? There's no way you're supposed to be over all of this that fast. <laughs> but when you really look at how that adversely impacted your life, it didn't. It's almost like getting offended when people change their perception of us. Listen to me. Everyone that has affection for you isn't an asset to you. So this is not being callous. I'm not talking about being callous. I'm talking about being logical. That there are some times when people had affection for you, but you didn't benefit from their affection. And so if you didn't benefit from their affection, you won't lose anything when they're no longer feeling that way toward you. And sometimes you're upset about stuff you lost when when you calculate your assets, you didn't lose nothing. You didn't hear what I just said. Yeah, what did I really use? I always paid for stuff. I prayed for you. You never prayed for me. I supported you. You never supported me. I was there for you. You were never there for me. I looked like I didn't lose anything but a freeloader. Thank you, Jesus. really do this on social media right you post something they don't like it's like I'm not following you anymore like I didn't know you were following me in the first place <laughs> see like the only person upset is you I didn't even know you were following me so sometimes to get out of the fence you got to step back and say what am I really offended about and is this just my ego and if it is you got to open the fence. Don't let your ego stop you from being altered. There's ego. Two, is, there's another fence. Sometimes it's the ego fence, and then there's a fence behind that one. <laughs> and that's the fence of entitlement. Entitlement. In every relationship, there are unspoken expectations. And people, if you love a person you feel entitled to them meeting expectations that you assume they should know that you hadn't communicated. Then you can be offended when they don't respond in a way that's consistent with expectations that you didn't communicate, but you assume because that's common sense to me, that's common sense to you. Because if you were having your grand opening, I would be there. So if you care for me the way I care about you, you will respond to me the way I respond to you. And what can end up happening is you can end up writing a narrative about a relationship that's not even true. Can't believe they were not there for me because I was there for them and they should have been here for And you have, you can feel entitled to people responding a certain way when they can care for you the way you care for them. But watch this. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to preach this till October, but I just, let me just throw it at you. It's sneak peek. It's, it's, it's just like Delilah and Samson's relationship. 
where she deceiving him the whole time, but mad at him when he wouldn't tell her the truth. Now, how you mad when you lying? Let me. <laughs> you mad. This thing. Now, you get on your high horse because you better at it than they are. Okay, I'm going to say that again because y'all didn't get. You can get on your high horse when you better at it than they are. So Delilah's lying, she didn't get caught. Samson's lying, he get caught. Now Delilah is on this, I cannot believe that you say you love me and you're lying to me. And she lying the whole time, she just didn't get caught. And that can happen in relationships when you can hold people to standards relationally that you're not living by. So you're expecting them to have empathy for you and show up when you need them to show up. But did you get facts in terms of why they didn't show up for you? Because they might have been depressed all week. Their baby might have been sick. And you can end up, yes, there are some relationships that need to be cut, but you can end up cutting one you should have kept. Because you wrote the whole book of your relationship based on one chapter. You got to get this, and for those of you, some of you in this room got major influence. Others of you in this house watching me online, God is giving you major influence, and he's going to open great doors for you. And if you don't know how to manage this, you will always be a slave to the unspoken expectations of other people. Because people will have rules that they want to operate the relationship by that they don't write down but then they'll send you to jail for breaking a law you didn't know was one. So sometimes you gotta step back and say, should I really be offended about this or am I offended because I feel like I'm entitled to a response and to empathy that I'm not giving? They can't just be tired. Well, if they really love me, they would press their way from me. But if you really love them, would you require it? See, it goes both ways. It goes both ways, right? So I got to say, okay, am I offended about something I feel entitled to that's unspoken? Am I holding them hostage to breaking rules they never agreed to keep. And then the last one, my time's up and y'all ready to go. The last one is this. It is the fence, offense of injury. This is not ego. This is not entitlement. This is when my life has been adversely impacted by something you've done. And it's hard to get over that one because I'm dealing with real hurt. Because the only way I come out of that fence is if I limp out. And some stuff, listen to this, this is why some people don't move from pain. This is why people, even in the grief cycle, some people go to a certain stage in the grief cycle and they get stuck. And they never come back on the other, they never come back on the other end of the cycle. They get to a place, because see, when something's hurting and you got to walk out on it, it's easier to keep your foot up and not move than it is to put pressure on it and get out. Because sometimes moving on hurt. But you got to limp your way out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I want you to hear this. Whenever somebody wrongs you, it's, it's, it's not your fault. You may have created, even in a relationship, you can create circumstances. You can help contribute to a relationship that's weak and makes it vulnerable to, for certain things. But you are never responsible for someone else's response. Not, right? So you can, you can create a relationship that makes it vulnerable to breaches. And you can contribute to that. But you are not responsible for anybody's response. When you're a child, you, you can give your mother a hard time growing up. But you're not responsible to be grown when you're a child. She grown. She should know you're a child.
You shouldn't have to be the mature one in a relationship with your daddy. He grown. Why I got to be the grown one? That hurts. It's injury. It's injury. And it's easier just to put your foot up and don't put any pressure on it. Don't touch the area I'm injured. I'm injured in this area. Don't touch it. I know you can't fix it without touching it, but it hurts so bad to touch it. Don't touch it. I know if I let you put a cast on it, it'll heal. But to put a cast on it, you got to touch it. Don't touch it. This hurts too bad for you to touch it. And for some of you in this room, you have carried your hurt. You, you have, your strength has become your weakness. Because you have had to be so strong so long. You know how to function in pain. Your tolerance for pain is so high because you've had to live with pain your whole life. So, so when I start talking about bringing your pain to a heavenly father that wants to make an exchange with you at the altar, you can't wrap your head around it because your whole life you had no outlet for it. And because you have carried it so long, when you get into a relationship with a heavenly father, who wants to give you a revelation that you are not designed to carry that and you don't have to, you don't even know how to give it up because your whole life you never had an option. I, I have never been without a support system. My mother and my father were there my whole life. If I got bullied at school, I would go home and tell my daddy. If I got in a jam with money, I would tell my daddy. When I needed an apartment, I'll tell my daddy. And daddy would do whatever he needed to do to make it happen. I would get sick, I would call my mama. I was married calling my mother. It caused a little tension in the beginning of my relationship. I'll be right here, first lady be right here, the phone be right there, I'll be like, baby, pass me the phone, let me call my mama, I'm sick. Yeah, give me the phone, what, I'm calling my mother. So many of you didn't, have, that's not your story. So when everything fall, fell apart, you had to put it together. When you got bullied, you had nobody to stick up for you. When you couldn't make the tuition, you had to figure it out. And so you've been doing it so long. It's normal. you've been carrying it so long you're weary and as strong as you've been you're saying to yourself I don't know how much strength I got left but there's a heavenly father who says I know you couldn't go to daddy when you were bullied but I told those who are bullied I warned those who were bullying you and I told them don't you touch my anointed do my servant no harm I told Zachariah to tell you that whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye I want you to get a revelation that you don't have to carry this anymore you got a daddy that's saying now bring it to me you don't have to act like you're not hurt bring it to me you don't have to act like you aren't mad. Bring it to me. Yes, Holy Spirit. You don't have to act like you don't want a relationship with your daddy. Bring it to me. Grieve it. Because it's only when you initiate the exchange that God can complete it. They made the offering, they received forgiveness. They made the offering, they received the fire. And when you give it to God, when you give to God what you're carrying, God gives to you what he's carrying. 
you don't have to carry this anymore. I'm hurt. Bring it to daddy. You might have to limp your way out, but bring it to daddy. I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to help you do that today. That he wants to perform the word he's proclaimed. It will not return to him void. It will accomplish what he sent it to do. Some of you, you're not, you're not out of the fence, but you own the fence. You got one foot in the fence and you got one foot out. And today the Holy Spirit's about to push you over the edge. You're getting ready to fall into freedom today. I, did, I don't hear anyone. I said you're getting ready to fall into freedom today. The Holy Spirit's going to give you a nudge. You can't surrender. This is the way you surrender hurt. Are y'all ready? You surrender your right to be hurt. Some of you say, I should be hurt. And you should. And you have a right to. But you have to surrender your rights. You know what that's called? Forgiveness. It's saying you, I got a reason to be mad, but you owe me nothing. Because I can't expect the one who hurt me to heal me. You can't fix this. No matter what you give me, no matter how many notes you write me, no matter how many times you text me and apologize, you can't fix this. Jesus, I need your help. And I want the Lord to help you surrender your rights. So that your religion will work. This changes everything. This is a catalyst moment for you. We're going to go, but I don't want you to miss this moment. This moment is catalytic. Because when offense is released, your prayer life becomes more effectual. Jesus said he's going to forgive us the way we forgive. Your prayer life, you, your prayers are going to be answered differently. When offense gets out of our heart, this affects everything. Do you believe that? Now, some of you may be at a place where your faith isn't high. That God can do this for you because your hurt is so deep. And today, I want to be like Mary and Martha. I want to, I, I want to stand in a gap. When Lazarus couldn't believe for himself, Mary and Martha believed for him. And what, what I'm preaching to you is what I know is right. I believe sometimes you don't even know if you've interpreted scripture correctly until you implement it and see whether or not it works. God is a healer. I don't care what they did. God is a healer. You are not, you are not held hostage to the dysfunction of what somebody else lived in and did to you. Their dysfunction is not sovereign. Their dysfunction does not have the last say. Their dysfunction is not all powerful. And what they did to you does not determine your destiny. The God that you serve, your redeemer, who takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it for good, has your destiny in his hands. And today, I want you to believe that healing is coming your way for your heart. If you're watching me online, I don't care when you're watching this, healing is coming your way for your heart. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our healer, for each and every person here that's carrying unspoken, non-disclosed, secret pain, father wounds, yes Lord, mother wounds. Those that by the time their mother grew up, they were grown and the damage had been done. So they celebrate a transformed mother, but they resent that their mother didn't transform before they raised them. God send help from Zion and heal the hearts of your people. 
I pray for those that are stuck in a stage in the grief process and I pray for breakthrough that today would be a renewed day where they recommit themselves to doing the work that needs to be done to get the breakthrough they need to receive and I pray that today our lives would never be the same I ask this in the mighty matchless redeeming restoring name of Jesus in Jesus name amen you receive that today what's up y'all thank you so much for watching this video this is my hope this is my prayer I hope it was simple yet significant I hope it was easy to understand yet impactful and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to share God's word with you and hopefully add value to your life. As always, I'm asking one thing of you, and that is if this message blessed you, I want you to share it, text it, email it to somebody else, because my mission is to help as many people as possible change their life so that they can help change the world. That's what we're all about, and we want to extend the reach, and you can help us do that. Thank you so much for being a part of this family. We consider you that, and I can't wait to see, see you real soon. Hopefully, you'll attend one of our locations. We've got locations in New Jersey. I'm there live on Sunday mornings. Four services right now, and two locations there. We also have a location in Orlando, Florida. I'm, that, I'm live there every Saturday at 5.30. I speak on Saturdays at 5.30 in Orlando. And then uh, Sunday mornings in New Jersey. Meet us at one of those campuses for our Los Angeles missional community that we've got that meets every Sunday evening. But either place, I, I hope to see you real soon. Take care. God bless.